Okay, so hello, I'm Harriet Fletcher and I'm a PhD researcher in the English department at Lancaster University in the UK. My research looks at the intersections of the Gothic and celebrity uh, from the 19th century to the present day. And I'm interested in how celebrities are portrayed in Gothic narratives, which I've often found is uh, decaying, dead or undead. And my thesis looks at a range of Gothic conventions, including vampires, portraits, and aging. I'm also interested in the Gothic, uh, in the ways that kind of uh, celebrities are represented in Gothic ways um, uh, and how they present themselves in real life. So my thesis looks at celebrities, including um, Lord Byron, Oscar Wilde, Lady Gaga, Andy Warhol, Betty Davis, and Joan Crawford. So there's a, there's a fun eclectic range there. So um, my talk is based around the idea that Dorian Gray is a gothic novel about a Victorian celebrity. Oscar Wilde was not only a celebrated author in this time period, but an individual who, had, who achieved international fame for his photographic image. Before he wrote any of his greatest works, he traveled to America, he had some photographs taken and they were widely circulated and he became a well-known public figure from these photographs. So, um, in a way, he was kind of the original Instagram celebrity of his day, if you like. Uh, and in many ways, Wilde's relationship with celebrity feeds into the novel, um, particularly through Dorian, the portrait, Basil, Lord Henry, Sybil and theatre. Although I'll only touch on a couple of those things today. So with this in mind, it's not a surprise that the novel manifests various anxieties about Victorian celebrity, particularly in relation to photographs. And this includes decaying portraits, losing control of your public image, gossip, obsessed fans, aging and fading into obscurity, all things that we might associate with celebrity gone wrong. So I wanted to start off by acknowledging a recent theatre production of The Picture of Dorian Gray. Um, and this is a production by Henry Philo Bennett and Tamara Harvey, which was streamed online earlier this year and was filmed through digital media like smartphones and Zoom calls. Um, I don't know if any, any of you managed to see it, but it was so interesting because it reworked the original narrative into a story about social media celebrity. So Dorian was a famous YouTuber who became obsessed with a selfie filter that made him look better online than in real life. Uh, and then Sybil was famous on TikTok and Lord Henry was famous uh, on Snapchat. And it really rooted Dorian Gray in the digital age. Um, so I found this production really exciting because it speaks directly to the historical context of the novel, um, which is a lot to do with photography and also Wilde's uh, celebrity that he achieved through photography. Uh, so when you examine this production alongside the novel, we can see that our experience of celebrity in the age of social media has a much longer history and that Wilde's novel is kind of like a proto horror story about the dangers of being an influencer. So this talk will be in three parts covering the following topics. So firstly, I'll look at Victorian photography, especially um, in uh, celebrity culture and Oscar Wilde's rise to fame. Uh, and this is kind of setting the scene of the picture of Dorian Gray. And then next I'll look at the photograph and the Gothic, um, specifically its characteristics in Victorian photography and how uh, these characteristics work gothically, drawing on the convention of the Gothic portrait. And then lastly, I'll delve into the picture of Dorian Gray with a few extracts and look at how the novel uh, gothicizes Victorian celebrity uh, culture in relation to celebrity photographs. So first of all, to summarize, these are the main points I'll cover in this part of the talk. The carte de visite is a collectible photograph that's connected to Victorian celebrity culture. Oscar Wilde became an international celebrity when he traveled to America in 1882, and photography played a central role in this. People often became famous for their photographic images, and for this kind of celebrity, youth and beauty is vital. So Victorian celebrity culture was highly visual, and photography played a crucial role in establishing new kinds of celebrities that were often only famous for their photographic images. Dorian epitomizes this kind of celebrity, as does Wilde at the beginning of his career, which I'll talk more about in a moment. While photography has an extensive history dating back to the 18th century, it flourished in 19th century consumer culture 
as a rapidly advancing technology that produced various types of photographs that could be purchased, collected and disseminated. The expansion of photography in the 19th century is aided by the democratisation of Victorian society, particularly the emergence of the new middle class in Europe and America. As Peter Hamilton and Roger Hargreaves explain, photography offered an exploitative technology and a new means of making and distributing images of the face for a group of people acutely conscious of social status and driven by the aspiration of self-advancement. If status, identity and self-promotion are valued in Victorian society, then it's no coincidence that photography became a primary means of establishing and disseminating celebrity images as well as those of the middle classes. The carte de visite is a particular type of photograph that's associated with celebrity. The, develop, the, the development of new technologies in the mid 19th century meant that photographs could be mass produced, which led to an international craze that became known as cardomania, which was the collecting of carte de visite. And they were small photographs, approximately nine centimeters by six centimeters, mounted on cards that could be stored in albums. So a bit like Pokemon cards, I suppose. These card, uh, these card photographs could be obtained from catalogues, traveling salesmen, uh, photography studios, local print shops, and trading among friends and family. The carte de visite was initially designed to be displayed and exchanged in Victorian parlors and commonly depicted non-celebrities, but the publication of Emperor Napoleon III's photographs boosted the popularity of this format beyond the home. Celebrities' photographs were also used in advertising. The actress and companion to the Prince of Wales, Lily Langtree, was the first woman to endorse a commercial product with her photograph, which was used to market Pears soap in the 1890s. The carte de visite became a popular format because it made celebrities into accessible commodities, laying the foundations for what's now a hallmark of modern celebrity culture. So I'm sure you want to have a look at some of these photographs. So I've got a couple here to show you. So first of all, this is a Lily Langtree's photograph advertising pear soap. And then this is Queen Victoria, unsurprisingly royals, very big for photography collectors. I suppose royals were kind of the first celebrities. And then this is Napoleon III. So uh, this is a very important photograph because, as I mentioned before, Napoleon's pictures really kick-started an interest in collecting celebrity photographs as opposed to photographs of people you already know. And then this is kind of a fun one. So this is Ella Wesner, who's a male impersonator. Um, Drag King is always fun. Um, and then uh, this one is actually kind of interesting because it says something about the democratisation of celebrity in the photography world. So in a photography shop, you see these kind of pictures of vaudeville stars um, alongside royalty like Queen Victoria. Um, so there's really a, a huge variety of celebrities circulating in this kind of world. And then this last one is perhaps the most significant in this context because uh, this is just a, a photograph of a bride who would be kind of a, a, a beauty that someone might collect. Um, and she might not seem explicitly famous, but she would have been uh, because collectors really valued beauty in their photographic subjects. So models, actresses, singers, dancers, brides, et cetera, were very popular choices for collectors. Uh, and this kind of photographic subject is, is the kind of photographic subject that Dorian represents in the novel. Due to its ability to be mass produced and sold as a commodity, the carte de visite allowed a type of celebrity to emerge in which individuals are primarily or entirely famous for their photographic images. While various accomplished public figures were using photography to consolidate their fame, like Charles Dickens and Tennyson, there were also individuals seeking to establish their fame through photography, such as models and aspiring actors. As someone who became famous for his photographic image before achieving success as an author, Wilde falls into this category of celebrity. Wilde's rise to fame began when he traveled to America in 1882. He traveled across 30 states and conducted approximately 150 public lectures, speaking to a diverse American audience, ranging from wealthy socialites to factory workers. He presented himself as a professor of aesthetics and spoke mainly on the subject of interior decorating. 
In New York, he visited the studio of the renowned photographer Napoleon Cerrone, who specialized in stylized portraits of popular celebrities, including actors, musicians, and authors. By 1882, Cerrone was a prolific photographer who had captured 200,000 people. Wilde sat for a series of photographs by Cerrone with the aim of establishing his celebrity image. Wilde then sold autographed cards to disease at venues like uh, theatre lobbies, women's clubs and amusement parks. The photographs boosted ticket sales for his public lectures and made him into the one, of, one of the most recognisable faces in America in 1882. His newfound fame led him to be invited to hundreds of exclusive parties alongside established authors like Walt, Mit Walt Whitman, Louisa May Alcott and Henry James. His image was also used to sell consumer products ranging from cigars and stoves to cosmetics. In a celebrity culture that's highly visual, aesthetics is important for enabling the celebrity's visibility. As uh, the author Camilla Elliott explains, apart from their dowdy queen, the public preferred female photographs of beauties, particularly princesses, actresses, and singers. For the celebrity who's famous for their photograph, it's essential to project an image that's recognizable and desirable to audiences. Projecting an image of youth, beauty, and glamour in their photograph not only creates an identifiable set of signifiers, but, but provokes attention from consumers looking to purchase cards to disease, especially if the photographic subject is unknown. For the celebrity who's entirely famous for their photographic image or relies on photography to build a celebrity image like Wilde, the actress, the singer, the beauty, or the model, it's essential to be desirable to ensure that their photographs will be displayed and purchased. This emphasis on youth and beauty also became important in photographs of established female celebrities. If the beauty, if, if the famous beauty is the most important, is the most popular form of carte de visite for collectors, then it's unsurprising that the Victorian literary market sought to make the female author into a photographic spectacle, even if the images had to be edited as uh, was the case with the author Marie Corelli, who is depicted on the left here. For years, Corelli avoided making photographs available to the public, but an official photograph was eventually published in 1906 as a frontispiece for her novel, The Treasure of Heaven. In an, an accompanying author's note, she explained that she had provided this likeness due to the demands of her readers and that the photograph captured her as I truly am today, she said. However, the photograph had been edited to make her look younger and thinner, which readers were unlikely to have known because this was the only photograph they had access to. The addition of the photograph helped make the novel a commercial success, selling 100,000 copies on the first day. This infamous edited photograph of Corelli aptly demonstrates the demand for a form of celebrity in which the author is a desirable photographic subject, which Wilde later fulfilled when he achieved success as an author. Although it was published in, in 1906, Corelli's photograph reveals the relationship between youth, beauty, fame, and commercial success that existed within Victorian celebrity culture. If the popular visual celebrity is largely the young, beautiful woman, then Wilde channels this in his photographs. He capitalizes on a feminized form of celebrity because he recognizes its commercial potential. The lavish and playful aesthetic of Wild Cerrone photographs has more in common with photographs of actresses like Sarah Bernhardt than authors like Charles Dickens. This aesthetic, aesthetic filters through into the picture of Dorian Gray. Wilde's feminized celebrity is echoed in the portrayal of Sybil the actress, as well as Dorian's youth and beauty and the photographic qualities of the portrait. So in this part of the talk, I'll be exploring the characteristics of Victorian photography, um, particularly the carte de visite and how these characteristics work gothically, and then rooting this discussion um, of the portrait in the Gothic tradition. So here's a summary of the main points I'll be discussing. The carte de visite makes the represented subject Gothic because one, this mass produced type of photograph fragments the subject's identity through doubling. Two, because photos can be edited, like Marie Corelli's, the subject is always depicted inauthentically, which estranges, estranges them from their own identity. 
and three, while immortalizing the subject, the photo also draws attention to the decay of the body. And then lastly, Victorian photography is an unstable technological medium that's constantly advancing, meaning that certain kinds of photographs risk becoming obsolete, threatening the longevity of celebrity. The celebrity carte de visite is a technological image that's rooted in the practice of portraiture. It's therefore necessary to consider the characteristics of this earlier art form because the photograph inherits many Gothic qualities from the portrait. The portrait has a long-standing relationship with the Gothic literary tradition, from the shape-shifting ancestral portrait of Horace Walpole's novel, The Castle of Otranto, to the haunted portraits of Vernon Lee's stories and the decaying portrait of the picture of Dorian Gray. It's unsurprising that the portrait is a staple of Gothic literature because the object itself displays many Gothic sensibilities and therefore invites such narrative representations. Firstly, the portrait creates an uncanny double of the subject. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend reading Sigmund Freud's, Freud's essay, The Uncanny, which introduces some really interesting theoretical ideas uh, that have become staples to the study of Gothic text and would definitely be useful if you want to look at the picture of Joy Gray. And the essay is very accessible online. So drawing on the work of Ernst Jentsch, Freud outlines a version of this theory whereby one doubts whether an apparently animate being is really alive, or conversely, whether a lifeless object might not in fact be animate. Freud cites wax figures, dolls and automata as examples of doubles that provoke this intellectual uncertainty, and the portrait can be added to this, to this, to this list. For this reason, the portrait is often at the forefront of uncanny experiences in Gothic narratives. As Camilla Elliott observes, the Gothic is filled with instances of doubling through which portraits are mistaken for bodies and vice versa. As well as toying with intellectual uncertainty between the animate body and the inanimate portrait, Gothic narratives also foreground instances of doubling specifically between the portrait and its represented subject. The uncanniness of the portrait is intensified in the carte de visite as a type of photograph that can be mass produced. Whereas the portrait creates an artistic double of the subject, the carte de visite creates multiple photographic doubles, further destabilizing the sitter's identity. The photographic image could also act as a substitute for the sitter's absent body, as Marie Corelli's famous edited photograph demonstrates. If readers had no knowledge of the author's appearance prior to the release of the edited photograph, then this photograph becomes a representation of the author's physical being. Various Gothic studies scholars are interested in, in the idea of multiple identities, uh, which is something that we often come across in Gothic fiction. For Robert Miles, the Gothic is a coherent code for the representation of fragmented subjectivity, and this is certainly applicable to Wilde's novel. Similarly, Halberstam argues that the picture of Dorian Gray produces a form of Gothic subjectivity because it presents the ego as multiformed as either a series of shifting surfaces or a volume of varied depth. Dorian's image is reproduced in various representational forms, including cast of Aziz. He's also the double of his makers, Lord Henry and Basil Hallward, and produces doubles of his own in the form of fans, all of which gesture towards the fragmentation of his photographic image and the gothicization of his celebrity. Secondly, while the portrait is traditionally concerned with expressing the likeness of the individual, it's also capable of showing a distorted view of the sitter. For Eliot, Gothic produces fears of loss of resemblance, and this is equally true of the photograph as much as the portrait. This is manifested in Gothic narratives through likenesses that no longer resemble their subjects, often through decay in the case of Dorian's portrait. Wilde's novel shows that the portrait can be both a likeness and a distortion. It can be both familiar and unfamiliar to the sitter. In context of the carte de visite, this notion of a distorted double echoes the way that celebrity photographs like Corelli's can be edited to make the subject appear young and beautiful, as well as the performativity involved in posing for a photograph as Wilde has shown. The celebrity carte de visite estranges the subject from their own body to the, to the degree that they may no longer be recognized in person, 
a gothic moment that actually happens in Wilde's novel when Dorian is misrecognized in the street by acquaintances and cannot be identified from his portrait when his body's found. The novel emphasizes the inauthenticity of the celebrity who's represented photographically or associated with photographic representation, like Dorian as a famous beauty. Lastly, the portrait immortalizes the subject by preserving their image. For Eliot, the portrait affords the individual an afterlife in a representational form and therefore continues to identify when the decaying body becomes illegible. It's a form of representation that allows the subject to pictorially transcend mortality while the physical body succumbs to it. The photograph's ability to immortalize the subject is significantly enhanced because it's a technological medium. Whereas Eliot claims that the portrait affords the individual an afterlife in representational form, the photograph affords an afterlife in technological form. The photograph is not only a form of representation, but one that's produced mechanically and therefore designed to withstand the passage of time beyond what's offered by the portrait. Eliot suggests that the portrait offers a means of preservation when the body succumbs to age. This means that despite preserving life, the portrait actually draws attention to the decay of the body. As Catherine Maxwell argues, the portrait is a memento mori, reminding its beholders of the subject's inevitable, inevitable submission to change and decay. This is certainly true of Dorian's portrait, which triggers an anxiety about aging, as my analysis of the novel will show later. However, the picture of Dorian Gray is also a narrative of celebrity. This anxiety about aging in Wilde's novel is connected to a more specific fear of the carte de visite failing to immortalize the celebrity, which Dorian's portrait taps into. In the Victorian period, this fear of not being preserved is justified because the carte de visite is an unstable technological medium that on the one hand promises to immortalize the celebrity and on the other hand threatens them with decay. Connotations of immortality are abundant in Victorian writings about this medium. In his presidential address to the Photographic Society in 1855, Sir Frederick Pollock commented on the photograph's power of rendering permanent that which appears to be as fleeting as the shadows that go across the dial, to the degree that no individual need now perish, but may be rendered immortal by the assistance of photography. Similarly, the photographer Julia Margaret Cameron frequently acknowledged the photograph's capacity to uh, preserve the subject, encouraging one potential sitter by claiming she shall be made immortal. If the photograph can immortalize the subject, then it has the power to render, the, render them eternally youthful, which is particularly important for the celebrity who's famous for their image. However, the photograph's ability to immortalize is problematized by its status as a precarious and swiftly developing form of media. The photograph developed in various forms throughout the 19th century, meaning that certain formats easily become outmoded. The daguerreotype, which was the first commercial photograph, was already outdated by Wilde's time, which was then overtaken by the popularity of the carte de visite in the mid to late 19th century, and then superseded by the cabinet card towards the end of the century, which was a larger photograph designed to be displayed in the home. The carte de visite is the ideal medium for representing, promoting and immortalizing the celebrity, but in its eventual obsolescence, it's also a medium that threatens the survival of the celebrity. The carte de visite operates gothically because it manifests a tension between the immortalization and the decay of the celebrity, and as such, presents an anxiety about the celebrity not being preserved. This is especially harmful for a celebrity like Wilde, who's famous for their photographic image. The picture of Dorian Gray is in dialogue with this anxiety about the cart's ability to preserve the celebrity which can be seen in the way that Wilde sets up an expectation of immortality within the novel celebrity culture, and then disrupts this through various moments of decay. 
So in this part of the talk, I'll be uh, exploring a few extracts from the picture of Dorian Gray and then uh, drawing on some of the ideas I discussed earlier in relation to celebrity photography and the Gothic. So to summarize, here are the main points that I'll be looking at. So when Dorian sees the, the portrait for the first time, it, it awakens a fear of aging that's connected to a fear of losing celebrity status. Dorian exists photographically. The way that his body is circulated, owned and gazed upon within high society imitates the celebrity carte de visite in Victorian culture. For Dorian, the portrait triggers an anxiety about aging that's rooted in a fear of losing celebrity status. Connotations of immortality surround the photograph in Victorian culture, but Roland Barthes' camera lucida reflections on photography complicates this by drawing out its deathly qualities. Uh, this is a really interesting theoretical text that talks about the photograph's inherent relationship with life and death and speaks to the, the photograph's Gothic characteristics if you're interested in having a look at it. For Bart, the photograph produces death whilst trying to preserve life. To be photographed is to experience a micro version of death in which the subject is rendered corpse-like through objectification. I am neither subject nor object, but a subject who feels he is becoming an object, Bart writes. This process of becoming the inanimate photographic image is comparable to becoming the inanimate corpse. To extend Bart's observations, this micro version of death and process of corpse-like objectification is closely linked to a fear of aging. Being photographed at the height of one's youth triggers an anxiety about losing this attribute, which is exactly what Dorian experiences when he sees his portrait for the first time. Initially, Dorian is in awe of the portrait's beauty. Wilde writes, a look of joy came into his eyes as if he'd recognized himself for the first time. He stood there motionless and in wonder, dimly conscious that Hallward was speaking to him, but not catching the meaning of his words. The sense of his own beauty came on him like a revelation. He had never felt it before. In viewing the portrait, Dorian is confronted with an image of himself at his best. Dorian's experience of his own beauty as a revelation and as though he'd never felt it before is a moment of estrangement that is key to the photograph's ability to trigger an anxiety about aging. For Camilla Elliot, the Gothic portrait produces fears of loss of resemblance, which is often manifested in narratives through bodies and portraits that no longer resemble one another for, uh, due to decay. Wilde's novel shows that this loss of resemblance is also a characteristic of the Gothic photograph. When the young and beautiful Dorian is painted by Basil, which is a symbolic act of photography, he experiences estrangement because he becomes aware that his body is a separate entity to the fixed image of the portrait. He says, I shall grow old and horrible and dreadful, but this picture will remain always young while the more, so, uh, yeah, that's the, the quote from the novel. Uh, while the mortality of the body is emphasized in relation to age, the youthfulness of the picture is emphasized through its ability to remain unchanged. Um, it will never be older than this particular day in June, Wilde writes, echoing Victorian discourses around the immortality of the photograph. Dorian's reaction reveals a juxtaposition between the decaying body and the immortal image, which gestures towards the photographic nature of the portrait. Dorian's dread of aging reveals a deeper fear of not being recognized, which is catastrophic for the celebrity because signifiers of youth and beauty are essential for constructing a familiar image and then attracting attention from collectors. This can be seen in Wilde's novel when Lord Henry's wife claims to recognize Dorian from her husband's vast collection of cast of seats. She says, I know you quite well by your photographs. My husband has got 17 of them. This very, very subtle moment reveals that Dorian is an established celebrity in fashionable society and can be recognized from his photographs due, his, due to his striking appearance. If Dorian ages, he can no longer be recognized and risks fading into obscurity a horror that actually manifests at the end of the novel when his body's found. Wilde writes, when they entered, they found hanging upon the wall a splendid portrait of their master, 
as they had as they had last seen him in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty lying on the floor was a dead man in evening dress with a knife in his heart he was withered wrinkled and loathsome of visage it was not until they examined the rings that they realized that they recognized who it was this gothic encounter with the corpse materializes the loss of resemblance that Elliot, Elliot wrote about. The body and the image are depicted alongside one another, yet they bear no relation. In Gothic narratives, the pleasures of doubleness quickly become the terrors of doubleness, as Catherine Spooner observes. Doubling often results in a loss of control over the double, so that it estranges the bearer from their original identity, trapping, trapping them in a role uh, that is experienced as alien to the self. While Spooner specifically cites the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in this example, the same can equally be said for the portrait in Wilde's novel. Focus is immediately drawn to the exquisite youth and beauty of the portrait over the withered, wrinkled and loathsome Dorian, because this photographic image is preferred over his real life body. Not only is Dorian's physical body unrecognizable, but it provokes revulsion. Here, Dorian epitomizes abjection as an embodiment of aging and death combined. The portrait is the familiar and superior master, while the body is the anonymous and abjective dead man. The portrait's superior beauty implied in Dorian's first encounter with it uh, foreshadowed this inevitable moment when the inanimate photographic double would eclipse his original identity. Failing to be recognized from one's image is therefore linked to a fear of this image taking over the subject's identity and rendering the physical body of the subject blank and irrelevant. The sheer anonymity of Dorian's corpse reveals that his desired photographic existence cannot be achieved without surrendering his identity. Dorian's fear of aging motivates his desire to embody the inanimate photographic image, while the portrait takes on the mortal qualities of the aging body. He expresses a longing to be objectified like a work of art and measures his worth against Basil's collection of fusible ornaments. He says, I am less to you than your ivory Hermes or your silver fawn. You will like them always. How long will you like me? Until I have my first wrinkle, I suppose. I know now that when one loses one's good looks, whatever they may be, one loses everything. This comment privileges the inanimate over the animate. Whereas the beauty of the decorative object remains fixed and ageless, Dorian fears that the beauty of his mortal body will succumb to decay. Dorian assigns aesthetic value to the object because it will be perpetually desirable, drawing attention to the ephemerality of desire that's available to him. This ephemerality of desire also implies an anxiety about the ephemerality of fame. How long? suggests a desire for immortality, which is bound up with eternal youth. For the Victorian celebrity, losing youth and beauty means losing celebrity status. He compares himself to decorative objects because he desires this inanimate existence to continue to be visible, desirable and relevant in this visual celebrity culture. Embodying a photographic image, while the portrait becomes the aging body, therefore enables Dorian to prolong his celebrity. This notion of achieving immortality through the technological image is reflected in contemporary retellings of the picture of Dorian Gray, in particular Will Self's novel, Dorian and Imitation, in which the portrait is modernized in the form of multiple video installations. Self's technological version of the portrait not only speaks to the photographic nature of Wilde's portrait, but consolidates the gothicness of Dorian's body, because in both novels, he becomes this technological image. Dorian's body takes on the role of the celebrity carte de visite that's circulated, owned and gazed upon, which is consolidated by the way that his admirers consume his image. Lord Henry likens Dorian to a decorative ornament, which gestures towards his status as a photographic object. Lord Henry treats Dorian's body as the object of his gaze, regarding him as some brainless, beautiful creature 
who should be here, uh, who should be always here in winter when we have no flowers to look at and always here in summer when we want something to chill our intelligence. Like the carte de visite, Dorian exists to be looked at, affirming the importance of his beauty in this culture of display. Lord Henry places importance on eternal beauty that will remain unchanged as the seasons pass, which sets up an expectation that Dorian must maintain his youth in order to maintain his visibility and therefore his desirability as a photographic object, echoing characteristics of Victorian visual celebrity culture. While Dorian's body is consumed as a photographic object in fashionable society, it's also made unstable because this photographic existence results in the circulation of his image in multiple forms. This is reinforced by Lord Henry's existing ownership of carts of visites, 17 of them as his wife revealed. He's not only an admirer of Dorian's body, but an avid collector of his photographs, which establishes a celebrity fan relationship between them. In the Victorian theater, for example, the photograph became a fetishized object that provided fans with an imagined closer relationship to the actor than that of the spectator in the auditorium. And in celebrity studies and fan studies, this imagined close relationship is, is known as a parasocial relationship. Dorian's photographs allow Lord Henry to simulate this relationship, while Dorian's photographic body that circulates in fashionable society is effectively another photograph to add to his collection. Through Lord Henry's fan behaviours, it becomes clear that Dorian's image is reproduced and circulated in various inanimate forms that reveal his photographic qualities. If an inanimate photographic existence is key to immortality for the celebrity, then Lord Henry's consumption and objectification of Dorian is essential for reinforcing this. As the celebrity studies critic Ellis Cashmore notes, fans operate in a culture of consumption and are not joyless victims of commodification, but cheerful contributors to the process. The celebrity cannot preserve their image by being photographed alone. This image must be circulated, owned and looked at. While the portrait does not entirely fulfill this role because it's hidden from view, Dorian's portrait takes on the role of the photograph that's circulated, owned and looked at. Lord Henry's obsession with the boy's image reveals Dorian's embodied imitation of the carte de visite that first captivated his admirer. However, Dorian's photographic existence also problematizes his desire for immortality. The precarity of photography as a technological medium indicates that Dorian's image exists in an unstable form of representation that's marked by a tension between immortality and decay. While the revelation that Dorian exists photographically implies that his image might be preserved through technology and mass production, the deathly qualities of the photograph, according to Roland Barthes, cannot be ignored. Appearing shortly after Dorian's proclamation that he wishes to change places with the portraits earlier on in the novel, the revelation that Lord Henry collects Dorian's photographs foreshadows the decay of Dorian's image. These photographs add a sense of deathliness to Dorian's state of being inanimate through the invocation of the corpse that's implied in Barthes' theory. For every action that Dorian takes to preserve his image, the threatening presence of the corpse and the suggestion of his, ine his uh, inevitable demise lurks in the novel's various photographic moments to undermine these actions. Dorian is not only gothicized through the inherently fragmented and inauthentic qualities of the carte de visite that he comes to embody, but due to the photograph, uh, due to photography's vulnerability to decay um, and precarity. As a collector of Dorian's photographs, Lord Henry is complicit in entrapping Dorian in this deathly photographic existence that eventually brings about his downfall. Through Lord Henry, Wilde's novel discloses the complex role of the fan or collector who both enables the immortality of the celebrity and reinforces their decay. So to conclude, the picture of Doreen Gray reveals the Gothic workings of the carte de visite and the kind of celebrity that this represents, building on Wilde's own photographic existence in Victorian celebrity culture. 
Dorian's fear of aging and obscurity and his subsequent desire to embody the inanimate photographic image engages with the paradoxical nature of the celebrity carte de visite, on the one hand, promising the subject immortality through technological representation, and on the other hand, threatening this immortality with potential obsolescence. The trajectory of Wilde's fame from his 1882 American lecture tour to the publication of The Picture of Dorian Gray in 1890 manifests a desire for preservation that's inherent in late 19th century's highly photographic celebrity culture. From photographic celebrity to literary celebrity, Wilde continually uses surface and performance to manufacture and reinvent his image, which is evident from his imitation of the Eastley in the Cerrone photographs to his later refashioning as a dandy. While Dorian's downfall is his obsession with maintaining a singular image of celebrity, resulting in an unconvincing performance and his eventual decay, Wilde's celebrity outside the text endures through reinvention. Beyond the novel, Dorian has become a celebrity in his own right. Like Dracula or Frankenstein's monster, he's transcended the original text and could be found in various avenues of pop culture, including films, TV shows, and stage productions. This is not surprising when we consider how much Dorian's existence is bound up with visual media. His photographic existence in Wilde's novel enables these later representations in digital media. So uh, that brings me to the end of my talk. Hopefully it's been interesting, a bit different, and it's given you something to think about. Um, so if you have any questions or you'd like to get in contact or for any source recommendations, I'm quite happy for you to email me or tweet me. My details are on the first slide. And um, thank you.